Welcome to Train Signal. You're watching Managing Permissions in UCS Manager. In this lesson, we're going to talk about several things. It's really going to be around the organizational structure, management, user accounts, and kind of centralized authentication and things like that. So we'll start with organizational structure in UCS Manager. And we really haven't done much with that at all. Even in the labs, it's, we've used the base, what we call root organization for almost everything. And then we'll look at organizational inheritance, kind of how we can use resources in another organization from a down level organization. What is role-based access control? Talking about how you assign privileges to a user. Then understanding roles and privileges and showing you how those two match up. Next is using locales. Locales are used to ease assignment of permissions. You know, if you want to give someone access to multiple kind of multiple different organizations, even in different kind of subtrees, we can use locales. Then centralized authentication, which is something that most people want to use for things like LDAP or RADIUS or TACAX authentication so that we can combine that with UCS Manager and not have duplicate accounts or groups. We can actually use a centralized authentication. And finally, just a real quick slide on combining these things for multi-tenancy. So with that, we'll just go ahead and get started. So within UCS Manager, there is an organizational structure. By default, the only thing it, it, in it is root. So if you look around at a normal UCS install, you see everything kind of created under this thing called root. And you're like, well, what is that? Well, the purpose is the fact that you could create suborgs under it to assign permissions and resources. Now, I'll be honest. Most people that I deal with, even inside of larger organizations, they kind of keep a very flat UCSM structure. They don't do a lot of suborgs, but you can. And you see this in multi-tenant environments or really large organizations with different teams who manage different compute resources. So there are absolute use cases for doing this. A couple things to keep in mind. Management structure within UCS is user-definable. You create your own. You don't have, it's not like it pulls it in from Active Directory or something. But it's only for management. It's not really for server operation. It doesn't do anything to keep you know, servers separate resources separate, anything like that. It really has to do for, you know, management and permissions within certain structures of UCS. And I'll show you this in the lab. It's useful for multi-tenant implementations of UCS to give people rights to their little world and not be able to change things in others. So by default, the only structure created is the root org. You can create sub-organizations under that. So you could create a finance or an accounting or production and DMZ or whatever you wanted to do. And under each org, you can create service profiles, pools, policies, etc. And if you don't select a, an organization, you just click at the top and say, create your service profile, it's automatically by default done at the root organizational level. One little gotcha. There's really no way to move an object from one org to another. It's like you can't really rename stuff in UCS. You can't really move things from one organization to another. So make sure when you create something, you're putting it where you want it to go. Some objects can be inherited through the organizational structure. For example, when you create a service profile at a low level, you can use identity pools at a higher org. So if I have root, production, and division A, and I'm creating a new service profile in division A, but all my Mac, WWDN, WWP, and UIDs are up at root, I can absolutely go up the tree and use those. And you can do things like if, you know, if you create sub resource pools down below, but they're not available, it'll go up the tree. The nice thing here is that it creates an atmosphere for standard configuration. So I can set some things at a top level and have people at a lower organizational structure level use those. That way I know that everything is unique and I know we're not trampling on each other for things like MAC addresses. And this also applies to other service policies like VNIC, firmware, disk, IPMI, VHBA, things like that. So it can make for a very standardized deployment structure. Here's just a quick shot of kind of inheritance where we're creating a service profile down at a low level organization, but we're using a MAC pool from a higher level. So we're using the MAC prod pool at the root level. And it just allows you to centralize those while still allowing some flexibility down at lower levels. Now, compute blades aren't owned by any organization. So you can't buy five blades and give three to this org and two to that org. If someone can create a server pool, and, or I'm sorry, if someone can create a service profile, they can associate it with any existing blade that supports that service profile. 
So that's something to keep in mind. You can't really segregate blade ownership like this. And the idea is that blades are a pool of resources to be used as needed. If you don't want someone to have access to them, you can't really restrict them based on this organizational membership structure. Keep an eye on that. It's not as simple as you would think. And what is role-based access control, RBOC? RBOC lets you assign permissions to a role. You know, very simple. Then you put people in that role. So by default, there's an administrator. That administrator has all the privileges in the system assigned to them, and then you can put a user in those sorts of roles. There are some defined or predefined roles like storage admin. Storage admin role has access to most of the SAN configuration. I may create a user called Joe and make him a storage admin. And that way, when I create Joe, I'm not having to go through and pick and choose all the permissions or privileges that a storage admin needs. I just create the role, assign Joe to that role. It's much more manageable than doing permissions per user. You could kind of see it as a group, but it's really, it's really not. It's more like a role of a type of, you know, type of access or privileges that you want a person to have. You need to understand the difference between roles and privileges, so it's important to understand that. Roles are made up of a collection of privileges. A user can be assigned to one or more roles. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship. So my user, Jason, I can be a network administrator and a storage administrator. I don't, I'm not just assigned to one. If you assign to multiple roles, the privileges are combined, so I get both access storage admin and network admin. Privileges are single right or capability. So a role normally will have one or more. A network admin will have privileges to create VNIC policies, change VNIC policies, create a VLAN, delete a VLAN, all sorts of little privileges that combine together to make a network admin role. And the idea being you simplify management by creating roles made up of the privilege that you want and then you assign them to a user or users to that role. Later, you can add other users to the same role. So if Joe leaves and we hire, you know, Susan and we want to give Susan the same access that Joe had, we just put her in the role that Joe used to have and I don't have to go back and remember which permissions that we assigned to Joe. Makes it a lot easier. So combining organizations and RBAC, the two are not really related. I mean, honestly, you can do one and not the other. You can have organizational structures without RBAC. Everyone logs in as administrator, but we have orgs for management and sectioning out things. So maybe, you know, there might be a one group of the company that uses different Mac or WWPN or different type of resources and naming standards that we would use and put in and have their own service profile. So we'd put those in a different org just for management and kind of keeping things straight. Doesn't mean that there's different permissions there. Everyone logged in as admin. You can also use RBAC without orgs. I have 20 different users, all with different privileges and roles, but they're all everything that we're doing is sitting in the root organization. But, you know, one person may have access to change networking functions, but not SAN. Another person may have access to SAN, but not network, everything being at the root level. You don't have to use both of them. Really, you don't have to use either of them. I mean, you just log in as admin and do everything as root. You're really not using either of them. So it's completely up to you, your organization, and how you want to manage UCS. There are some predefined roles here. I've got two names for them. So a lot of times, for example, server admin. In Cisco documentation, it's called server admin. In UCS manager, it's called server equipment. I don't know why they do that. I'm, I'm not really sure. The training material does the same thing. If you look and UCSM, they're not named like that. I get what they're trying to do, but I'm not really sure why they call them different things. But a server admin or server equipment in UCSM does the things you would think he could do. You can management of physical blades, of service profiles, maintenance, and other items. A network admin or network role in UCSM changes things like VLANs, uplinks, trunks, and other items related to external connectivity. So I think a second ago I gave you the example of doing VNIC policies. By default, they don't have access to that. It's really only external connectivity. Storage admins are the same way. They do things like vSANs, uplinks, and fiber channel. And then you have operations, which allows for monitoring of false events and call home. One thing you'll see about these is that if I'm a storage admin, I still have read-only access to about everything else. It's not like the storage admin can only click on the storage or the SAN tab, and that's all that person sees. You have visibility into other things, so it's not useful if you want to hide things from someone. I still can read it. I just can't make changes to it, and that's an important distinction. 
So let's jump over to the lab. So in the lab, we're just going to look at the predefined roles and show which privileges they have assigned. This will be a quick lab. Kind of want to show you where they're at so you can see what I mean when I uh, talk about their naming and what their privileges are. So let's jump on over. And also, for this, we can use the UCSPE environment. So again, if you don't have hardware gear or something like that, we can easily work with RBAC and organizational management using PE. So I'll jump over to my PE environment and we'll get started. So here we are once again in UCS PE running 1.4. For things RBAC based, we go over to the admin tab. Go down to user services and then roles. So we take a look here. Here's all your default. So the ones I listed weren't totally everything, but it's the major ones that you need to know. If we want to look at it, for example, admin, we just double click on him and you see that he has the admin privileges, which is the easy give me everything. If we look at network, he gets external land config, external plan policy, external land QS, external land security, but he doesn't get access to other things. He does get service profile network, network policy, QoS, QoS policy. Actually, that's he does have access to the network policy, so that's good to know. That has changed a little bit. And then pod configurations, QoS, things like that. So pretty much what you would expect to see. Storage is pretty much the same thing. External connectivity for storage and service profile storage and storage policies. Yeah, pretty simple, right? I mean, if you want to create a new one, You just create your role, give it a name, JSON, which is not really a role. Let's call it a uh, super user or infra guy for infrastructure guy. And he gets external, 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 and external. And you're done. So it's really easy to create a new role and kind of figure out what you want to do and what you want to add. Go through and check the boxes. There's also one here called read only that's sometimes useful. You don't have access to anything. And remember what I said a minute ago, even if I give you, if I give you rights to something, you still have read only access to everything else. So the read only role just has no access, but he has access to read anything. So some people that's kind of a problem. I've had people kind of balk at that, but I don't see anything in UCS that you really need to restrict people from. In a multi-tenant environment, you shouldn't let any of the tenants in UCS manager. That's not the purpose here. They should be doing other things and, and provisioning resources through a kind of a, a process, not in UCSM. And so that way you can just see that. Roles, most of the time we will see people assign a network roles to a network team, storage role to the storage team. Operations may go to someone doing management or kind of monitoring of the environment. And then if they need to, you know, if the network team needs to add a VLAN to be trunked, they can do that without being able to mess up anything in a server in a service policy or, or that. So real simple, like I said, it's a quick lab. Let's jump back over to the slide deck. So next is locales. Locales are a collection of orgs and are used to help assign roles for management. And and the thing is they don't the orgs don't have to be related. So think of a locale as a group or a container of just different organizations you want to give this user access to with the roles that you've assigned. If I put three different orgs in a, in a locale and assign it to a user, I don't get to pick and choose that this guy is a network admin in one and a storage admin in the other. Remember that the roles are combined so they get access to all that in each organization. But it's very useful for assigning privileges to many different organizations with one role or one user account. And again, you know, you can have 20 different orgs and sub-orgs and pick and choose the four that you want completely independent of how they're set up and to combine that into one locale. Now, I put required for external to use external authentication there. That's what it has said in the actual Cisco training documentation when I've, I've gone through the class. But I don't see anywhere that's required. So I put that out there in case you get that a question on the exams and sometimes the exams are based on the training docs. But I just, you know, I went back through again Active Directory and LDAP and Radius authentication implementations and example guides on Cisco's site and they never talk about requiring a locale. But just keep that in mind it may be required and also keep that in mind on the exam. So I know we just got out of the lab but let's jump back over and what I'm going to do is I'm going to create some sub orgs just to use as examples. Then I'll create a locale, put them in there. We'll create a user. 
assign them one or more role, and then I'll show you how that impacts the user and what their capabilities are. Now, I used the PE environment a minute ago, but I can't do that for this. I just I noticed that when I tried to create the suborgs, that it's locking up my Java client. That may happen to you, but again, I'm using 1.4 PE for this, and if you're using 2.0, it's probably fine, but I'm going to use my physical environment. So with that, let's go ahead and jump over there. So here we are once again back in the physical world. So a couple things we want to do first is create some suborgs. So in the admin tab, you scroll down where you see root, and here we can create our suborgs. And if we look, I've already got a few. I've got Citrix, VMware, and Wintel that we already have in the lab. But let me create an org. I'll call this prod and say OK. And then underneath prod, I'll create manufacturing. And this is in no way actually model after a real organization. But that gives me root, prod, manufacturing, Citrix, VMware, and Wintel. Then let me go up and I will create a new locale. We do that under user management, locales. So we hit the little plus sign, user lab locale. And then we just kind of drag any organizations that we want over to it. So for this, I'm going to do manufacturing. VMware and prod. And this is a really cheesy little graphic over here on the right, but it shows how everything is contained. So we'll say OK. Then I want to set up a user. So right under user services is local authenticated users. And I'll create a new one. Login ID, Jason. Fair warning, this is case sensitive. If I did capital J A S O N, that's different than lowercase. information in and then I will use a password I know we have restrictions on that you can have an active or inactive so you can set an account as inactive later if you want it to expire check the box and set that here pick the role that you want me to have so I'm going to do network and storage and the locale lab locale if you don't pick a locale it's considered all but I'll do that and then down at the bottom for SSH, you can actually turn on key-based authentication instead of password. So if you want SSH into interconnects or something like that. I love key-based authentication because I hate tracking passwords, but that's a discussion for a different day. And there we go. So I created some orgs, created a locale, combined some together, a user with roles and a locale, and now we'll test it out. So to do that, I'll just log back in double click the Java file again to kind of cheat and log in as JSON and, and and here we are I am now logged in as me so examples let's go to the land tab actually let's first go to servers I don't have any permissions here but if you remember I talked about how if I don't have permissions to something, that means I only have read-only access. So I don't have any change permissions to anything in servers. But I can I can go in there and see everything that's already been configured on my policies, my pools, my service profiles, all that. But if I try to create one, it's not going to let me. It's not going to let me create anything in here. If I go to LAN and go to root, it's not going to let me create anything there. But if I go to a suborg such as prod, I think I put prod in there, yep, it will let me create things here. So it just depends, you know, that's what the use of locale. So prod and VMware, I can do things, but Citrix, I cannot. And that's the beauty of putting these together. So it's really simple. Just understand the differences between them, you know, what you use locales for, basically a grouping of orgs, what you use group orgs for, which is management control of the UCS environment, but not really resources like blades. And then you have roles, which are assigned permissions, and then a user is assigned one or more roles. So with that, let's jump back over to the slide deck. So in most data centers, there's some sort of a central authentication method, and usually that's something like Radius, TACAX, LDAP, slash Active Directory. You know, you don't want to create local accounts on every different environment you have. We want to do that against a central environment. So it's useful for account management and auditing. 
And real simple, when using you know central authentication, UCS passes credentials. So you log into the UCS window just like I did. It then passes that over to the central authentication server who says yes or no. And if it says yes, you're given access. When using some authentication methods, you must make a change to the server schema. And this is very important. So it's required and it's just really good to know. Must add a Cisco specific attribute to the user's account. For LDAP, it's Cisco AV pair. For Radius and TACAX, it is Cisco dash AV dash pair. And how you actually implement that change completely depends on what you're using. If you're using Cisco's TACAX or like Cisco Secure ACS, it'll do one way against someone else's Radius implementation or Active Directory. So you'll need to look that up and see how you do it. We're just going to jump to the lab real quick. This is just going to be a tour and showing you some of the options that you do for configuring these authentication mechanisms. Now, I'm not going to do a, an actual deployment lab. The reason being is, is it changes and it greatly depends. If you're an Active Directory account, that's one thing. If you're, you know, Radius accounts, that's completely different. Most people that we see authenticate against AD because that's what everybody has, but some do it against Radius or TACAX because you know, that's what they use for Cisco environment or auditing and logging. My suggestion to you is Cisco site under configuration examples for UCS has examples for all of them, for AD, for Radius, for TACAX. Look at the guide. It'll walk you step by step through how to configure it, how to do both sides of that configuration, and how to test it. But let's go ahead and just jump to the lab real quick. So again, we're back over on the admin tab. And I'm viewing this as me because I'm not going to make any changes so I can have read-only access. But under user management, we have things like authentication and authentication domains. I created one here called local domain for local authentication. And for each LDAP, radius, and TACAX, you have a subtree where you'll create like provider groups to where you set up things like, you know, the names, the servers, what you're using them for. So the host name or IP of the, you know, the uh, LDAP server, distinguished names that you might need, whether you want to enable SSL, filters, attributes, any of that. And this stuff varies. So if I look at TACAX providers plus, you'll see that it's different than RADIUS or LDAP. So that's why I say it's kind of varies depending on what you're doing, and it varies greatly. But everything is done under user management, and then you set up the authentication and your different schemes that you want to use, and then you'll see people in remotely authenticated users. So with that, I mean, it gives you a good idea of where you need to go, and, it, you know, again, I suggest you look at the configuration examples and guides on Cisco's site for that. So after that very quick tour, let's jump back over to the slide deck. And finally, combining for multi-tenancy. And when I say multi-tenancy, I don't mean like, you know, a hosting center given all their customers access to UCSM. What I mean is an organization with you know business units or sub orgs or groups or however you want to phrase it with different access or different kind of management domains within UCS. So to do that you use org structure which is your management hierarchy for US UCSM and remember it has no real effect on the operation of the blades. You can assign blades to any org. Locales which where we take some of these organizations dump them in a locale kind of group and ease administration and management so I can assign that locale to a user and that user gets access from their roles in all those orgs. And then you have RBAC, role-based access control. Ease is management configuration used to delegate for, uh, privileges to users and only manages access within UCS Manager, not to blades, not to their operating systems. So if I restrict access to some things in UCSM, that doesn't mean I can't remote desktop into that other group servers. It's, there's no correlation there. It is only for management within UCSM itself. So that's it for this lesson. We covered several things having to do with RBAC and ORCs. We started with organizational structure in UCSM. Showed you how you can have a tree structure that is used for management only and not for like blade ownership. Organizational inheritance where you can have identity and resource pools at the top of the org and then organizations at the bottom can use those so you kind of do an inheritance rule. You can standardize your deployments, your naming standards and form factors for all your different UUIDs and WWPNs. Then what is role-based access control or RBAC? We have a user or we really we take a role, we create a role, give it a name, 
and assign privileges to it. Then we create a user and give them that or you know one or more different roles and they combine together for their entire set of privileges. That pretty much you know already explains roles and privileges. We talked about how those two are related and what the exact differences were. A role is made up of a collection of privileges. And then locales. Locales are really just a group of orgs. They don't have to be parent, parent, child, or anything like that. It's just a bunch of different orgs put together to make assigning privileges to a role or a user much easier. Centralized authentication, a quick tour of LDAP, Radius, TACAX, Active Directory uh, configuration with these, within UCSM. And once again, go look at the configuration examples from UCS for your particular environment, and it'll walk you through everything you need. Just also remember, to add that schema, the Cisco AV pair schema update. And finally, combining for multi-tenancy. So taking everything that we just talked about in the lesson and showing you how to deploy that for, you know, a multi-internal tenant type configuration with UCS. So that's it for this lesson. These are features that I think are underutilized in most UCS deployments. And I think the reasoning for that is, is that you take a look at other blade uh, manufacturers and other server manufacturers, and no one has this all-encompassing ecosystem that UCS has. And so there really hasn't been a way to implement this sort of organizational structure within other server environments. And that's why we're seeing it, you know, a slow adoption rate with UCS. As people get used to it and deployments get larger and larger, I think we'll see more people using this. But that's it for this lesson. I look forward to seeing you on the next one.